You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. All right, everybody. That music means it is Interview Tuesday. That means it is time once again for Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. Like the man said, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. Remind me, if you like what you hear, not just for this show, but all the other nearly dozen shows that are hitting the network, usually multiple times a day out there, keep rating and reviewing it in your platform of choice. The network's been around for Oh, about 14 years now. But believe it or not, there are new people discovering it every day, particularly in the madness that was 2020 and now into 2021. We like to be the lighthouse in these stormy seas. So if you want to help folks continue to discover the network and indeed the programming in the troubled times, keep rating and reviewing it on your platform of choice. It really does help new folks find a place to turn in these interesting times. Of course, keep sending those questions and comments, too. We do love to hear from you guys and gals out there. And let's see who we're hearing from. On the old program today, I am joined by Ryan Sala. He is the co-CEO over there at Gatsby. Ryan, welcome back to the Options Insider radio program. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be back. Well, Ryan, it's it's been a little while since you and I chatted. You and I chatted all the way back in the crazy, heady, dark days of OIC 2019, also the last in-person OIC conference that there was. So it's been a while now, coming up on uh, two years pretty soon, which is kind of kind of scary to say out loud, but that's how long it's been. So obviously back then when we first chatted, Gatsby was still very much in the initial stage. You hadn't even really launched to the public yet. And obviously since then, we've seen a lot of new, new people joining the network obviously here as well. So let's start at the beginning for everyone who missed your previous appearance or maybe aren't familiar with what you folks are up to. What the heck is Gatsby? Obviously, the the free brokerage space is awash with players these days. What is it that that sets Gatsby apart from the crowd, sir? Yeah, yeah. Gatsby is a, uh, I guess, 2021 now uh, top to bottom rethink of a retail options trading platform. So, you know, of course, it's a crowded space. There's a lot of places to trade for free. But, you know, the options traders of the world have always preferred trading on options platforms. And as we see it right now, there's a real dearth of options-focused trading platforms, especially in the zero-commission world. And so that's where Gatsby fits in. We, we very much uh, 
have always seen ourselves in the lineage of people like uh, Options House and Options Express and Thinkorswim. And you guys have taken an approach, which we've seen done in the past, which is, of course, trying to take the Options product, which can be intimidating, off-putting to some people, and trying, I won't say dumb it down, but make it in a more palatable, easy-to-understand type uh, approach, even if you don't really know much about options. So walk us through that approach and and why you guys decided to go that way, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that most options trading platforms have always tried to do that. I I would say that, you know, what makes a a brokerage platform approachable in 2021 is a lot, you know, is very different from what made a 2010 brokerage platform approachable. Um, So, you know, we think we're sort of doing a modern take on you know, what is a very common story in the options world. But of course, it involves, you know, making things simple and cutting out jargon and defining things and making it, you know, visually appealing and social features so people can see what each other are doing. Um, but to to us, really, the biggest component of it is uh, a sort of intelligent take on suitability. Because while we've all seen the retail options world, you know, grow by some metrics like 50% in 2020, to us, um, it's of no value to the customer or the brokerage firm or the industry as a whole to have people come in, make an options trade that they, you know, really don't feel confident in and isn't, you know, rooted in some decent amount of understanding um, and then, you know, have a bad experience, lose money and leave and give up on the asset class forever. So for us, you know, it's important to be a part of actually growing, you know, the breadth of the retail option space. while at the same time, you know, giving people something of guardrails so that as they, you know, get deeper and deeper into options trading, they, you know, sort of have a good experience and, you know, do, uh, uh, you know, intelligent things. And even when customers lose money, it's really important to us that, you know, people know why they lost money because really the worst experience in options trading is come in, you're new to it, you buy a contract, you know, it goes underwater and you have no idea what went wrong. And so that is, you know, that entire sort of suitability and uh, education is like what underpins Gatsby. That's interesting. I like that you bring up the guardrails approach because a lot of people in the space for a while now have been wondering if we've made options trading maybe too easy and ushered in a whole new crowd of people who obviously don't really understand the risks that they're undertaking, which at the end of the day isn't beneficial to anyone. I know in the early iterations of your platform, you had it set up where it was pretty much predominantly buy orders that people could come in and say if they wanted to bet for or effectively against a particular underlying, then you'd have them obviously buy a call or buy a put. Is that still the way the platform is structured or have you kind of evolved beyond that a little bit? No, so we've gotten well beyond that. And of course, you know, like any brokerage platform, you can buy equities and you can trade spreads and things like that. But it, I think an important shift in the ideology around retail options trading in the last 20 years is that for for forever, it was always seen that your first options trade should always be a covered call, right? So we lived in this world where, you know, some large percentage of retail options trades were covered calls. And that we really believe isn't true anymore. Most people don't come into options wanting to get into covered calls and, you know, or or sort of selling options in general. Most of these new traders are coming to the market looking to buy options. And so what we really try to do is you know, make an experience where you can come in and buy, you know, a single leg long option as your first trade, figure out the mechanics, figure out, you know, the basics of how the Greeks work and how, you know, the, uh, the, uh, sort of value of the option, you know, as it pertains to the price of the underlier moves, um, and then grow from there. So we have this sort of like adaptive system where you come in when you get started, your cash account. And yes, all you can do is, you know, trade long options. And then as you get more sophisticated or demonstrate to the compliance and ops team or, you know, start to have some traction in your account, we open it up to more stuff. So, you know, eventually, you know, this may be my personal take, but I really believe most good options traders eventually move into trading multi-leg strategies. Um, But, you know, our thinking is, some very large percentage of these new traders come in and are you know, effectively looking to buy options. 
that's interesting. So you come to the Try Gatsby platform now, and, and you check out the app, and you, you guys are pretty much app exclusive. You're on, you know, iOS and, and Android predominantly, which again speaks to the audience you guys are going for. Forget that old school web based platform <laughs> out there. But it's interesting that kind of approach you just outlined there, where you come in and you're effectively sounds like limited to, to buying first, but as you, I guess, prove your bona fides there, you get to expand your strategies. Kind of going back to those guardrails you were talking about earlier, maybe seeing if people understand what they're doing. They can't just come in and, let's say, get approved for level three type options trading right off the bat, Ryan. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I mean, you know, effectively, we don't want to put anybody in a situation where they can lose more than, say, the principal that they put into a trade or at least a very clearly defined amount without having a pretty good understanding of options trading. Most of the horror stories you hear are from, you know, platforms doing exactly what you just described, which is, hey, you answered the suitability questions, right? Here's level three options, go have at it. And there are just a lot of mechanics and you really need to understand, you know, the kind of uncapped risk of selling an option and how to collateralize it. So, you know, one, yes, that that is extremely important to us that you come in and you're you know, initial trades are capped risk where it's very understandable. Um, and then, you know, two, as it pertains to like extending margin to customers and allowing them to trade sort of uncovered, Gatsby falls squarely on the paranoid side of the equation. So we really don't, ex- you know, in the spectrum of brokerage platforms that extend, you know, risk to their customers, we're way, way, way on the paranoid side of that spectrum. So we're very, very careful with you know, giving customers the ability to have losses beyond, you know, a very predefined level. I like that approach. That's something I've been talking about on the network for a while is maybe collectively as an industry, it's gotten far too easy. I I helped some people set up some new accounts last year. I haven't gone through that process myself in a while. And I, I was kind of flabbergasted at how easy it is for anyone almost to get level three approval with answering a couple of the questions on a web page at most of your major brokers out there. We all know level three, that's kind of the keys to the kingdom. That's where you can do a lot of damage to yourself if you don't know what you're doing. So I, I kind of like the approach of build it up, prove it as you go, and then evolve from there. But let's get into it. We've kind of alluded to 2020. 2020 was pick any adjective and it pretty much applies to the year that was 2020. But the one you hear bandied about the most often is unprecedented Insane is also another one in there. From a very laser-focused options perspective, 2020 was the best year in the history of the business. I mean, it, it dwarfs every other year. Even 2018, which was a previous record year and a very standout year, 50% beyond that in terms of volume. So in terms of the years to launch a new options brokerage platform, Ryan, you kind of hit it out of the park with that one. 2020, probably the best year in history for that. That was really your first real full year of operations under your belt over there at Gatsby. Walk us through, how was that from your perspective? Did you see a lot of account growth? Did you see a lot of darts growth? And what was it like launching effectively a new broker in the midst of obviously a heavy volume year, but also an insane year just about every other capacity? Yeah, yeah. It uh, you know, certainly was a tailwind, you know, by and large, I would say uh, uh, all else aside, it was it was uh, amazing. And I, I don't think we could have timed it better. To some extent, it's kind of funny. It's like, uh, what's well, a good analogy? It's like moving to a new town and uh, across the country and trying to get a sense for what the weather is like in this new place you live, but you happen to move there in the middle of a hurricane. And so you have no context. And like, it really feels that way. Like, it's hard for us to figure out like what's normal in our user data and our acquisition costs and our, you know, average trade volume, because all we've had is this one year of just absolutely insane, you know, ups and downs. Um, it was, you know, it was a real trial by fire because we, we launched the platform, you know, say we took it out of private beta at the end of December of uh, 2019, really January and February were like, you know, getting our feet underneath us. And then immediately, like right when we started to feel like the, uh, we were on solid ground, you know, March hit and some of our competitors had major outages and then the, you know, the sort of markets tanked and then the volume, you know, options volume spiked. And then, you know, the, uh, the stimulus checks started flowing and the retail volume really spiked. And then, you know, we, weathered it and we did amazingly and I was really proud of my team. And then, you know, I like the rest of the industry, the summer was kind of calm and like things were, uh, 
starting to settle down and we really felt like, okay, this is what the norm, this is what's normal in the option space. And then bam, like we come out of summer and it's, you know, uh, uh, election and then, you know, GameStop and everything else, all the meme stocks. And so it's just been this like whirlwind of, of, uh, boom and bust and ebbs and flows in the industry. So I would say all in all, it's been amazing, but, uh, it's really, uh, you know, from, from a pure data perspective, it's very hard to find trend lines and norm normalcy in that data. Yeah, that's certainly true. You know, it was a double real home run for you guys. Cause not just was options volume through the roof, but in the specific audience that you guys are targeting that very beginner retail type options trader, that volume exploded to levels. I don't think anyone really anticipated, you know, we're talking about a million plus new one lots hitting the options markets daily in 2020 that weren't there just a year ago. So this, market has been awakened and opened to an entirely new audience, which just so happens to fit with the demographic you guys are going after, right? So sometimes they say it's better to be lucky than smart, right? It certainly worked out from that perspective. I, I think without a doubt, I was more lucky than smart, but uh, I, I'm with you. The, you know, and, and like the average, you know, I think as of last check, the average trade on Gatsby was shy of two contracts. So, you know, we, we are helping these customers that are, you know, very new options traders. And that's why it's so important to us. Like it remains to be seen how many of these people who are entering the options markets are going to stick around and are really going to develop like an affinity for the asset. Um, and so we're always harping on the fact that it's really of no value to bring a, a you know, I think, you know, you know, as well as anyone, it's really easy to have a bad time in options, right? They're very risky. They're, they're complicated. They're, you know, a derivative. Um, it's very, easy and it's probably you know the default outcome to have a bad time and and uh you know whether it's not understanding the mechanics or losing too much money or whatever you know not being able to stomach the risk it's just an asset that is you know sort of more sort of deceptively complicated and so that's where we're really putting our energy and focus for the first part of this year is that like yes the eyeballs are here there's all these new customers coming to market but like i said it's of, it's to no one's benefit especially not ours and really especially not the industries to have people come in and have a bad time. So that doesn't mean making money. That doesn't mean everybody has to, you know, bet on the right side of a mean stock. Um, but what it does mean is you have to help people understand the mechanics and, you know, when they lose money, they really got to know why they lost money. You know, I always use the analogy. It's like walking into a casino and if I sit down and I play blackjack and I lose, you know, whatever I put down, that's fine. I understand blackjack. I understand the mechanics. I just got a bad draw. If I sit down and I sit in front of a slot machine and I pull the lever and, you know, I don't get the right combination of numbers and my money's gone, then, you know, I'm not coming back. And so what, you know, we're trying to do and what I hope most brokerage firms that facilitate retail options trading are trying to do is, you know, build a long lasting you know, growth and uh, adoption trend in retail options and not just have this be some kind of a flash in the pan. Well, of course, there's been a lot of, shall we say, drama in your neck of the brokerage space of late. I remember back when we sat down almost a couple of years ago at the OIC conference, you know, the obvious question when anyone's talking about launching a new free options brokerage is, you know, how are you going to make money from this? Obviously, margin used to be a big pillar of revenue for brokerage firms, not so much anymore commissions obviously you're going to be zero commission so no revenue there so the other obvious pillar is of course payment for order flow one of the things that robin had seemed to paint themselves into a corner with is they were very cagey early on about whether or not they were going to take payment or not you guys from the outset never really minced words about it you guys very early on when at least when i spoke with you you said that you were going to take payment that was going to be a core revenue model for gatsby of course fast forward nearly a couple of years and the entire world has turned on its head. Wonky things like payment for order flow are now suddenly trending on Twitter. We have the CEOs of Robinhood and others being marched before Congress to answer for their payment practices. We even, this has to be the apex, I would have to think. Michael Bolton has been hired to go out there and sing a song about payment for order flow by one of your competitors out there. So, so PFOP is on another level right now. It's very much under the microscope. In fact, uh, the same competitor that hired Michael Bolton, that was public.com, also recently decided to do away with the practice and replace it with a, I think, pretty laughable, but still a, a optional tipping model, <laughs> which is 
got to be a, a new thing for the brokerage space. So obviously, this model, Ryan, has come under intense heat, intense scrutiny since the last time we chatted. What is going on with Gatsby in terms of PFOP? Are you guys still going to take it? Is that the plan going forward? And has this recent controversy caused any rethinking of that? Yeah. So, so first of all, I, you know, I, I love public.com. I, I use the platform. I absolutely love it. And, uh, I also love Michael Bolton. So, you know, uh, on both of those, uh, well, there's no accounting for taste, sir, but I won't hold that against you. Well, okay, that's fair. But, um, you know, I, I, I see why a equities broker would, you know, make a decision like that. It's, um, you know, payment for order flow in the equity side of the equation is relatively, uh, sort of call it commoditized. Um, you know, we, you know, same as it was a year and a half or two years ago when we last spoke. Yes, we're super open about payment for order flow. And the reason we are is because I think our customers are smart. And, you know, it's it's kind of a no brainer when you have a small account uh, to opt for a payment for order flow based model over a commission based model. You really have to be trading a lot of volume for commissions to be more cost effective than the payment for order flow model. Um, but with that said, you know, we, of course, we understand the concern, right? The biggest concern in retail options around payment for order flow is that you've created a conflict of interest between the brokerage firm and the customer. And the brokerage firm has to be representing the customer's best interest. That's the law. That's what customers expect. Um, and so that is the problem with payment for order flow. So our take on it, so what basically what Gatsby does is we share the payment for order flow with the customer. So depending on, you know, we you have to do a little bit of estimating to do determine what kind of a payment for order flow rebate the contract will get, but we actually rebate a percentage of that back to the customer in these, you know, we call it Gatsby rewards and it goes back into your account and you can retrade on those dollars. So that's how we, you know, have approached the issue. And like I said, I really think the, the issue with payment for order flow is the caginess. You know, I've, I had my four members of my immediate family text me, a couple of weeks ago asking me to explain payment for order flow to them, people I would not have expected to have an interest in, you know, the low level monetization mechanics of the brokerage industry. So it is out there. And I think the, you know, the, the being coy and cagey about it has done nobody any favors. Um, so our goal is to be open and honest and, you know, very clear about how we make money. I think like I said, everybody's smart. Customers are smart. They know brokerage firms are not charities and they're not, you know, there to just provide free trading tools for out of the goodness of their heart. Um, we really think that payment for order flow is just simply a better monetization scheme than commissions were. It's also worth noting that back in the era of commissions, almost every brokerage firm also earned payment for order flow. So it's not like the two are just this mutually exclusive thing. Um, but, you know, with that said, We'll see where the market lands if the industry or the regulatory nature of um, how you monetize retail order flow changes. Then, you know, we'll be right there changing with it. But as it stands, I personally would always opt for a brokerage firm that had no commissions um, but sold the order flow. You know, maybe that's a personal preference, but that's that's kind of where I fall. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned, of course, the the conflict of interest, which has been my issue with payment for order flow going back multiple decades. This is an, an old topic. It's funny that everything old is new again. We we banned discussion of it on our network over a decade ago because it was too wonky and is in the weeds and no one really seemed to care. Fast forward to today, like we said, Michael Bolton singing about it and suddenly people people care about it and know what it is again, which is kind of fascinating to me. But you mentioned one of my issues with it as well, which is, of course, it creates this conflict of interest. And everyone's so up in arms about the GameStop and what Robin Hood did about limiting GameStop trades, they're looking past what I think is the the real damning evidence against them, which is, of course, the SEC leveled a historic $65 million fine against them for terrible execution. They were effectively ripping off their customers by having terrible execution as part of that whole PFOP model. So that gets back to the question. Obviously, execution, Ryan, has become much more under the microscope these days as well. So customers over there at Gatsby, how's the execution? How's the best X? Are you guys living up to that end of the brokerage bargain, sir? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is like, you know, options, you know, execution quality on the equity side of the equation is, call it at least 100 times less, say, important to customers than it is on the option side of the equation, right? Whatever the price improvement you get, you can multiply that by 100. That's why payment for order flow rebates are so high. So, you know, all of that is to say that options trading customers have very little tolerance for poor execution. And even on a retail platform, 
it's not an option to have poor execution quality. It's just non-starter. It's like having delayed market data or some other very like JV feature. It just does not fit into what good options traders look for. So, you know, broadly speaking, our order flow, our, our uh, execution quality has to be as good as the competitors. It just isn't an option for us not to be. Beyond that, it is a selling point. It's something that people look at. You know, you can tell. It's very easy to tell when, you know, you got filled at the uh, filled at the ask or did better. And and so, you know, in being open about payment for order flow, we also, you know, have to be super open about execution quality and providing best in class execution quality is absolutely a must for us and any brokerage platform. So I'm not going to hear about the SEC knocking on Gatsby's door anytime in the near future about execution quality, Ryan. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Let's keep our fingers crossed on that front. But you kind of mentioned, you know, the good timing you guys are having now coming into 2021. I saw you guys just raised about four or almost five million dollars on the Seed Invest platform. Clearly, this outrage over payment and particularly geared towards Robinhood and what they did around the GameStop and the meme stock seems to really have fueled this hunger for a alternative to that platform. And you guys, again, right place, right time, out there raising money uh, right now, raised about 4 to $5 million on Seed Invest. So clearly people are voting with their wallets in terms of where they want an alternative and they want new alternatives. So you raise all this money. What's that going to go for? What's the plans for that money over there at Gatsby? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, obviously super successful Series A. We're, we're going to be announcing it pretty soon. It actually, we're actually going to extend it a little bit because the demand was just beyond, uh, beyond what... Uh, you know, it was, uh, as you can imagine, it kind of closed out right into the middle of this meme stock uh, hysteria. And so, um, you know, it, in the end, it was it exceeded our wildest expectations. Like any brokerage firm, we've got our, you know, areas of focus is user acquisition, compliance and operations and product development. Um, I will say a very outsized portion of our Series A funding is going to go into product development. I mean, we want to do everything this year. It's really like, you know, name the feature, we want to add it, but with a options focused and kind of modern take on it. So there's going to be a really heavy focus as we, uh, you know, put our roadmap together for the rest of the year on uh, social stuff and, you know, cool trading tools and things that just demystify and de-jargonify the option space. Um, you know, we want to give people access to every custom multi-leg option strategy they want to do. I'll say, you know, there's there's a couple things we're probably not going to do or we're probably not going to change our um, take on margin. You know, we I really think if you, you know, if you want to borrow money to trade, there's better places to borrow money than from your brokerage firm. And I, you know, on a personal level, don't know that it instills the best sort of uh, trading habits. So that's probably something we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on. Um, I will say one pipe dream that I have, and this is, a dream still it's you know we'd spent a little bit of time on the r&d side of this trying to put it together it, it it is going to take a lot of work but we really want to be ahead of the game in terms of like fractional options so it isn't something anybody has really done in any meaningful way other than the exchanges underwriting like mini contracts but we really believe that there's a way to mitigate the risk and manage the um sort of subscription of you know a one share options contract and to us, the single biggest barrier to entry for retail options trading is that 100x multiplier. That's you know what makes them, in many cases, unaffordable, especially for underliers that are higher priced. So, you know, don't expect this to launch anytime soon. It's definitely something that we're working on that uh, we want to be sort of first to market with. But we, at present, think there's definitely a way to make that happen. Interesting. So obviously you watched that whole uh, mini options fiasco, which I have to say, I've been doing this for a long time. And that was one of the few things where I saw the entire industry was behind it. The brokers, the exchanges, the customers, everyone wanted this thing. And then it launched and it fell on its face as it one of the more infamous uh, implosions in the options market history. But you think you guys have cracked it, Ryan. You guys are on the case of perhaps the new iteration, the new evolution of mini options. Yeah, I think I, you know, I think, I, well, certainly we, I have opinions for why it didn't go right the last time. And I think there's another sort of groundswell coming at the exchange level for trying to create, you know, new mini contracts that are fix some of those problems. But with that said, I mean, in my mind, the dream scenario isn't a, you know, 10 share contract on of some index option. To me, 
the dream scenario is being able to take a very liquid name like, say, Tesla and a very liquid series of Tesla and be able to trade a single share option on Tesla. And Tesla is a uniquely good example because, you know, everybody knows premiums are super high. The, you know, even after a split, the price of the share is super high. So it's one that, um, you know, illustrates the point well. But, you know, my belief is that it is doable on a limited number of names and a limited number of series to actually borrow some of the concepts that go into fractional stock trading and apply them to fractional options trading. Might be a pipe dream. You know, I, I, we have to see uh, if the, uh, you know, where the math shakes out on it. But that is like my ultimate uh, roadmap goal. Well, it's always good to dream there, Ryan. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of our little sojourn here on the Options Insider Radio Program. I have to say, I am excited. That's something I've been wondering, and I've been hearing hints in the background for a while that maybe this time for yet another tilt at the mini-slash-micro-slash-fractional options windmill. It sounds like you're in that camp as well. And one of the areas where the industry fell apart was certainly on the brokerage front. They tried to gouge these one-tenth size contracts and charge full commissions. And we all know in this modern era, that won't be an issue. So maybe, perhaps... The way is paid for another tilt at the mini options. But before we go, Ryan, you kind of just gave us actually a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to look forward to from Gatsby. But if folks are intrigued, maybe they want to kick the tires for themselves and literally try Gatsby. Uh, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, I mean, you can go to the App Store. It's on uh, iOS and Android and uh, download it, open an account. It should only take a couple minutes and then uh, start trading. There you go. It's just Gatsby. Like you spell it like the character from the novel. Give him a follow on the old social medias as well at Try Gatsby on Twitter over there as well. Ryan, I'll thank you for joining us. And we'll keep an eye on how all this, especially the, I like the idea of the mini options. You got me excited here, Ryan. I'll see how all this unfolds in the marketplace in the coming months. It's great to be here. Thanks, Mark. All right. And I want to thank everyone out there for downloading, streaming, for listening live. And of course, sending in your questions and your comments and your feedback. Stay tuned, of course. A lot more hitting you on the network than just Interview Tuesday. We have Education Wednesday coming up tomorrow with Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio. I know you all love those shows. Thursday, we're back again with Episode 2 of the Option Block and TWIFO this week in Futures Options. Friday, Volatility Views. It kicks off again on Monday with Option Block and the Crypto Rundown. Right back again to another Interview Tuesday and another episode of Options Insider Radio. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.